the debt typically begins to dissipate as you begin to re-architect and, and pull out the code that you want to keep. You can eliminate dead code that's sitting there that you're not using anymore. And newer architectures allow you to be more agile and to be able to release on a more frequent basis. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 177, How to Modernize Legacy Applications. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your host, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. We hear about AI these days, and usually the first thing that pops to mind is creating gorilla NFTs. Victor, what do you think of when you hear AI today? I thought it was monkeys, not gorillas. Oh, was it monkeys? Yeah. I've lost track. I don't know. <laughs> Let's imagine something for a moment, if you will. What if we could use AI to go out, check out our applications, automatically figure out what's going on with those things, break down the dependencies, magically turn them into microservices, and then have them automatically running on Kubernetes, and I never have to look at a legacy application ever again. Are you aware how many man hours would be lost? How many people you are trying to put on the street? You want to damage the economy? Is that where you're going? In these days of recession? Is it Friday where you are? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is sort of science fiction, right? But there's a grain of truth to it. We have Bob Quillen on from V Function. Bob, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Thanks, Darren. Victor. Hey, hey. V Function tends to, even though I went quite a bit overblown, there is a grain of truth in that. Isn't that true, Bob? Oh, oh absolutely. It's a uh, application modernization is a has a rich history. 20, 30, 40 years it goes back to mainframes and trying to make them better and all the way through job applications, enterprise applications. And I'm sure the applications we write today will become legacies in the future. So modernization is something that we live with all the time, but how we did it has always been very manual. And it's, it's a great target for applying AI and machine learning because there's accepted best practices, but they're painful. They're filled with frustration. They're difficult to deal with as are any monolith and any, any legacy app. I mean, problems it is, you know, typically the team is that's maintaining it, didn't write it. It might be 10, 20 years old. There was some intent when it was designed, you hope, <laughs> uh, but you may not know what that is. So it's a great target to actually apply new technologies, AI, uh, machine learning, automation, a lot of the stuff DevOps, you know, focuses on to observability and, and kind of digging into things that are more continuous and have a lot of the new tech applied to it. And seeing how we actually take this very difficult part of the transition to the cloud, kind of where many apps are stalled today is sitting on-prem waiting to go to the cloud or, or a monolith that's already been moved to the cloud, but it's still sitting there as a monolith, just eating up bandwidth, eating up CPU, eating up memory. So it's a target-rich environment. Uh, it's a difficult problem to solve, and, and that's kind of why the function uh, was started. I'm old. Victor's not old, but older. He's been through these changes. Let's start with what do we consider application modernization in 2022? That's a great question. We um, <laughs> we just did a survey ourselves to kind of level set. We did this with Wakefield Research and to level set kind of where you know, the market is, where the industry is. There's seven R's that typically define uh, modernization. If you go look at the literature from you know, rehosting and replatforming to rewriting, retiring to refactoring and rearchitecting. So that, and there's, there's probably, and every time I look, there's another R, there might be nine R's, 11 R's at this point, but 
the idea is that there's a, a range of options for people to actually upgrade and move their application to this next generation. And people have been trying to do this for a while. Cloud you know, migrations, move to digital transformation, if you will, has really accelerated that, that need and that desire. You know, the, so the motivation is there, but you know, how you do it is, is the key. What we found is as we talk to customers, there's a, a recognition that to modernize really requires you to you know, look at the architecture, look at you know, either refactor or re-architect you know, how the application is organized. Many people look at like lift and shift as an option for a modernization. They get mixed up with migration to the cloud and modernization. We see that happening a lot. And that's really, I think, where a lot of the industry has been in terms of cloud movement and uh, the transformation to the cloud. There's applications migrate to the cloud in the, in the current form they're in. They either move as a monolith, maybe run in bare metal machines, or maybe you put them in a container. You kind of replatform them and run them in a container. But they're still a monolith and they're eating up bandwidth. They don't scale. There's tons of technical debt that's happening. So I think what we're seeing is a, a, a recognition that modernization requires you to kind of think of how you take something that's written in an older form, really designed for older aging architectures, you know, both infrastructure and application architecture. How do you move them into something that takes advantage of the cloud, you know, microservices, containers, Kubernetes, all that scalability and agility you get with the cloud. How do you take those monoliths and move them forward? And, and I think that's where modernization is defined. We saw both refactoring and re-architecting being kind of the, the top two items as people define modernization today, where rehosting and replatforming is a stopgap that gets you kind of into the cloud where you lift and shift it. Um, we're seeing a lot more focus on how do I take an application and move it into the future and into a, a more viable place where it can, I can reduce my technical debt and start to take advantage of all the goodness that the cloud offers. So you're talking about cloud here, but we've, we've spoke also around Kubernetes. Do people really need to go to cloud? Yeah, that's, you know, that, that's up somewhat up, more up to debate than it, than it used to be. We, we hear a lot about people have moved to the cloud and maybe repatriate back to on-prem. So I think for cloud native architectures, we see many folks do stay on-prem. They just want to move their current architecture, be it dated and be it legacy into something that's more, more modern. And that can happen by using, you know, on-prem technologies from, you know, VMware or from OpenShift, or Red Hat, places like that, that have cloud native platforms. Kubernetes runs fine on-prem as it runs in the cloud. So um, the cloud, provides that that scalability and you know much of probably what you as you all talk about all the DevOps benefits as you get in terms of managed services. So you're gaining some of that. But it's not necessarily a, a prerequisite for modernization. Uh, many people keep the stuff on prem and can do modernization and take advantage of still that ability to be more agile, you know, like a scale, you know, instead of just vertically and if I want to, you know, support more users or have seasonality or I have issues. You know, I want to be able to control. I don't have that horizontal scalability that you would have a Kubernetes or something in a container architecture. You have to scale vertically and just buy a bigger machine or add more CPU memory. It gets very expensive. Typically, it's that technical debt that begins to weigh you down as you kind of adding more and more to that existing architecture. And it, for many customers, it breaks. They they hit that tipping tipping point and they can't actually uh, you know meet customer requirements. They start fail to uh, fail customer. Uh, contracts, you know, the business is beginning to ask, why can't I get features faster? And, you know, COVID and the last two or three years have shown that you have to be able to be agile. You have to have that agility and re reaction time to changes that you didn't expect. So you need to have an architecture that supports that. So, and that's, you know, the architecture drives, it can help the business and uh, can also help kind of, you know, you organize your teams in different ways too. And we also talk about that as we go to in terms of culture and people. You brought up technical debt a few times. If I was to take a legacy application that's full of technical debt and I re-architect it or re-platform it or one of the R's, unless I take the time to really do something about that technical debt, I'm just carrying it forward and probably making it worse. How do we sort of manage that in a, a little more sane manner? Yeah, and I think the you know the goal with technical debt, you know, people look at it, one of the things we saw in surveys is, is we split up our the survey from executives versus architects themselves. As they look at it, technical debt kind of shows up in two different ways. One is, you know, the effect it has on innovation. 
if I'm carrying 80% technical debt, I can only spend 20% on innovation. So, you know, where executives are trying to innovate, you know, the architects and engineers are trying to chip away at the technical debt that's that's bogging them down. I mean, and they're maintaining this these uh, monolithic architectures that just weren't designed to go forward. So the the debt typically begins to dissipate as you begin to re-architect and, and pull out the code that you want to keep. You can uh, eliminate dead code. And some people call that zombie code that's sitting there that you're not using anymore. And newer architectures allow you to be more agile and have a, be able to release on, on a more frequent basis. You know, you have building CI, CD, continuous pipelines. You'll be able to employ new techniques that are designed to, you know, continuously address technical debt going forward. So, you know, one of the be- beautiful things about refactoring is you can retain the, the business logic um, that maybe is where your IP is in your enterprise application. So most of these enterprise apps, if you're going to modernize them, they're, they, these are viable business applications that are people running, they're running the business. You know, these are your, your back office, your, your inventories, your shipping, your purchasing. You know, there's a lot of key applications for every business that are running on these monoliths. The IP is tied up in the business logic. So being able to pull that business logic out and be able to move it into a new architecture and eliminate kind of what's pulling you down, which is kind of the, the older code, the older architectures, the way they were built, and kind of also the the platforms that you're carrying that are, that are kind of no longer their legacy in and of themselves, be they older Java architectures, be they older database architectures, et cetera. So being able to move forward, eliminate what you're maintaining and be able to retain the stuff you like, your intellectual property is one of the benefits of refactoring. And, and that was one of the things that, that we do is we kind of maintain the source code as it is, pull that forward. If it's Java, when you, when you refactor, it'll be Java when you go forward, but you can run that in, in a container in a more, uh, more effective microservice. Smaller team can manage it. And it's usually built around the idea of a domain. It's domain driven, so it has a business function. Smaller agile team can manage it, which also plays well to remote workplaces that are becoming very prevalent today too. So. I think there's there's so many different ways that it benefits the technology, the business, and the people that, and all those things have high impact on your technical debt and ability to chip away and address it, so you can start focusing on the business functions versus just the maintaining these older platforms. When does old become mm-hmm. too old? <laughs> you know, like if it would be a house, you want to keep it up to date, you want to renovate, fix the pipes and so on and so forth, and maybe it's a bit too old. But in one moment comes the in one moment comes the time to say, and or does it ever actually come the time to say, no, actually, for this particular house, it makes more sense to shut it down, destroy it, and start over. Yeah, absolutely. I I think there's a you know, rewriting is a that's the R that responds, that kind of corresponds to that knocking down the house completely. If you're going to remodel it, that's more like a refactoring and re-architecting. And there's good good parallels there too. It's like, you know, if you like the the bones of the house and you want to be able to maintain them and then update your kitchen and update you know, parts of your house, it's probably more cost effective to go ahead and then, you know, refactor, remodel, re-architect it itself. But knocking it down completely is it's going to take take more time. One of the things that we do is we measure technical debt. We also measure the complexity of how to refactor this application. Sometimes the complexity is so high that you may not have any choice, but just to knock the whole thing down. But you need to be, be able to you know, quantify that upfront based upon the complexity, the, the degree of dependencies and entanglement. We, we can identify how well our technology can apply and be used to pull it apart. But there are times where you may want to either rewrite the whole thing or replace it you know, if there's an equivalent SaaS product. Maybe you're, you wrote your own Salesforce automation or your own ERP way back when, but there's m- more, you know, there's more available things today that you could just actually plug into a SaaS application. So rewriting, replacing with SaaS, those are kind of business decisions. But if it's a core IP that is core to your company and, and the, running that application it affects your competitive advantage and you want to maintain those components to that and rewriting is going to take too much time and there's, you know, you want to, retain some of the value that's still in there. Refactoring, re-architecting is probably the fastest way to do that. And also it lowers the risk. So, you know, a lot of engineers and developers want to rewrite, but what they will do is they'll pull in code 
from existing you know applications and you know, you want to keep the good stuff you don't want to throw all the baby with the bathwater, so to speak and you want to pull that forward so we see there's a continuum of refactoring re-architecting and rewriting where you know be able to take your existing monolith and be able to break it down and pull out selectively components that are important to you or is pretty critical what you're mesh talking about right now to me you're actually explaining not often mentioned but in my head the major benefit of microservices actually as you said at the very beginning yeah everything becomes legacy sooner or later right but if your legacy is is a set of a number of relatively small applications then that future decisions to refactor, rewrite, uh, re-architecture, what's or not, is going to be infinitely easier because now you're talking about what to do with something that is a fraction of what it was. Yeah, there's a a new train of thought. You see it happening a lot coming out of the analyst community. Gartner talks about a lot called continuous modernization, uh, continuous assessment, and you know as you move your monolith, which are very hard to maintain and modernize into smaller pieces, you are in a better position to always, as part of every release cycle, have a, you know some component that's continuously measuring and, and watching for architectural drift, you might say. You have architectural standards, you are comparing that against your smaller microservice there, and you see it start drifting and adding debt, be able to measure that and be able to chip away at that. Debt's kind of a thing people, developers know architects and managers see because it's like dragging down your your cycles and your release times uh, but it's really hard to measure and point out but it allows you to stay in front of debt for sure and keep a continuous modernization posture that allows you to like you do with mon- you would monitor your infrastructure all the time you want to monitor your application architecture all the time too and make sure you're not drifting into a bad spot victor made the joke earlier on about okay we're going to get rid of all the labor because All the AI is going to get rid of us. And you mentioned the survey that you did where you talked and how it was different between the leaders and the architects. But I noticed you left out the people who actually do the work. Now, am I saying that leaders and architects don't do work? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. They push around a lot of paper, they draw a lot of pictures, but they actually don't do the work. When an architect or when a leader makes this decision to, hey, we're going to magically re-architect everything. We're going to the cloud. We're going to Kubernetes. Is that always the smartest decision? There's never a blanket answer to you know whether I think it it depends on uh, the application itself, the business value, the debt you're carrying. So there's a lot of factors that go into that. So I think one one of the key things we saw in the, that survey was the fact that the lack of uh, a business case, setting expectations managing the risk and analysis up front and having those questions answered in advance is a big part of a, a successful a modernization pattern or best practice. So people, the reason they fail is they don't set those expectations. They don't know what they're trying to accomplish as they get into it. So having that measurement, having the ROI, having some plan in advance, you assess and understand your application up front. Then you can actually you know, say that you, you can make a more data-driven decision versus a gut decision of whether it makes sense to modernize. There is pushback and, and there's a fear factor and that pops up also in not only our surveys, but a lot of other surveys, DevOps surveys. Anytime you're trying to move into a new kind of approach, be it modernization or be it operational procedures and best practices, there's a fear of change, uh, loss of role. One of the things that you know, we look at with refactoring in particular is that it's a nice bridge for developers because it takes an existing set of code and helps you move it forward in a new architecture. Granted, you're in a new architecture, but the code is that you're maintaining is the same. So you, if it was Java in, it was Java out. So Java, the developers are still necessary as they move forward. And it provides a nice bridging mechanism. There's still training required to get your team together. There's having organizational efficiency is important. So there's new, new team topologies that come out of that and you have a smaller team, but it helps... It helps build bridges, I think, between the, the old and the new. I think that's important because, you know, if you're going to rewrite it, a lot of times you're going to rewrite it with, with new developers. But refactoring, re-architecting can provide a way to pull in some of your most important assets on the uh, cultural side and uh, the people side because that's, that's, that's important. In two of our biggest customers that we're working with right now, one of their top 
goals or objectives for app modernization is to you know, help reduce the, the load on bringing in developers to maintain and recruit and retain those developers on the, the legacy code. Because it's really hard to bring those in, hire new developers to manage old code that maybe old know, know the old code, et cetera. So much easier to kind of recruit on a, on some of the newer technology. So you know, they're looking to also try to modernize their teams and they're having difficulty in even recruiting, retaining and maintaining uh, the teams they have. So there's a people side of things where you could help bring your team forward and it also helps keep them, make them happier. They're able to work on new new tech and that's kind of makes it more fun. I think it's a, it's a way to bring things forward. And I, I like the idea of bridging the old with the new and that's where refactoring your architecting with, for versus just breaking, you know, level setting the house, you're actually, you know, taking it forward. So um, you're able to keep your people that work in your house today can keep working on the house going forward. That's kind of a paradox in a way. People who are rejecting change, uh, modernization, call it whatever you want, people who are stopping uh, or keeping the legacy alive are slowing company down, right? Are preventing company from moving forward. Nevertheless, those are typically people who were created by that same company, mm -hmm. right? Because, hey, actually, I promote you to uh, principal something, something because you're the only person who actually has 20 years of experience in this thing. Mm -hmm. And now you're stopping me down. So it's almost as if companies need also to figure out how to deal with it, how not to create the very persona that is stopping them down in a way. Correct. And it's been an issue. And I kind of worked on the container and Kubernetes cloud native side for the last probably five to seven years now. And 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 I and I've seen that kind of tension with existing teams trying to how do you train them, move, help them move forward, you know, give them something they recognize and, and that helps them you, you want to give them a path to move forward with. You want to give them the training. There's a key management a responsibility of, of, of being the leader through this. So, so helping your team and being the leader to set set the the path, you know, to make sure you're retaining and and training that team up so you can bring them forward. Uh, but if it's a, if it's critical for the business, then the leader needs to stand firm too and say this is the direction we're going, and this is where we're, and having the right people in place that can help make that happen. But it doesn't have to be at the expense of the team that that, that brought you there. I think there's ways to bring that forward and. If they do, if people do put their heels in the ground and drag their feet and become the, the anchor, um, that's their choice. They can go find another monolith to manage, um, maybe. But I do think people want to, most developers want the challenge of being able to up their value, get their, their resume to the next generation. And it just actually can help their career a lot. And there's plenty of um, resources, conferences, meetups, podcasts that can train you up and get you up to speed and make sure you, you've you've upskilled as you go through this. This is a great opportunity to upskill your team too. I think the problem with that though, is it appears a lot of the upper levels of the company, we're talking about the, the people at the bottom of the food chain, the people at the top of the food chain don't want to change because it affects their bonuses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's another, that's where we see, uh, you know, a lot of pushback too is, you know, there's risk, there's frustration, all these kind of projects have been cost, on average, you know, $1.5 million or more. I think it was what we surveyed. It take, you know, one and a half, two years. They fail 97, no, 79% of the people that we've surveyed have had failures in app modernization. So there's a, there's a high failure rate. There's a high degree of risk. But I say there is a tipping point where there's no choice. Where you, there's so much tech debt, you're not able to meet requirements. You're going to lose your job if you're not able to meet the business needs and, and innovate and change. And that's kind of where these mandates start coming in. We're going to move to the cloud. We're going to modernize X percent. We're going to start taking advantage of these new technologies because we have to. So, you know, top down, that's where leadership begins to set, set the set the goals. And then that that middle and lower level can start you know flowing in behind that. So it goes both ways. You're right. There is fear of change at the top. Um, but that fear of change will eventually result in them by losing their job because they can't meet requirements. If they're able to meet the requirements of, of the business without modernizing, there's no need to modernize, really. So uh, really, this is a business objective. It's not just a technical thing. The tech is fun. It's fun to work in the cloud and, and the new technology, but you're doing it for agility, velocity, innovation, 
I think all the DevOps surveys I read of people who have higher release cycles that are you know, high performers, higher retention rates, the cut, their employees are happier and their revenue is much higher on a regular basis. So there's a, these adopters of the, of the new technology, it helps the business in addition to helping the tech side of things too. But we see, it's interesting, we see enterprises, organizations who are in the cloud already, they've been in the cloud five to 10 years and they're running monoliths still. So they, they were maybe a gen, gen one, first generation cloud SaaS provider or something like that. Now they're start, they've kind of reached that point of they can't innovate enough. They have new competitors coming in, you know, people who are now the, the new breed of born in the cloud, the unicorns that are beginning to eat their lunch. So um, they need to find ways to innovate and, and add value. So they're starting to modernize. And you wouldn't think that someone that's running a, a SaaS product on top of AWS, for example, is a, uh, a target for modernization. But there's a lot of monoliths in the cloud that need to be modernized. And we're seeing that as one of our kind of key use cases today is people who did the lift and shift, got there, and they have kind of a migration remorse. They're like, oh gosh, now I'm in the cloud and my costs are going up and I can't be as competitive as I used to be. So so that's a, uh, lots of, lots of factors that are, you know, affecting the, uh, you know, the need to move to the cloud. And there's also a lot of factors that are suppressing that in terms of, uh, you know, fear of change from the top and the bottom. So let's talk about vFunction for just a second. Again, going back to the magical, here's the AI, punch the button, and we all go live on an island somewhere. What is the process like? I, I bring in an app, six apps. What I mean, walk me through sort of a happy path process. Don't And, and ignore, let's, let's, let's completely make this unrealistic. There are no politics to be dealt with. How, how do I move from my on-premise? I've got some Java apps running in Tomcat. I may may have some .NET. I'm assuming .NET might be covered, may not be. You know, what 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 does that look like? Yeah, there's two forms of of measurement or observability that we we start with, and and that's that's helpful. That you know, since this is purpose built for app modernization, we're really looking at dependencies. We're going to watch the application in production or in a staging environment. So we do a dynamic analysis that's sampling memory and looking at all the database calls. It's a JVM agent that's watching the Java interactions or .NET interactions in that case. And it's actually looking at all the behavior of the application in real time. Many customers put us in production, but they also can, or you can run in test or staging and, and then run tests against it. We also do a static analysis where we look at the static code and look at static dependencies too. That's super useful because you see, you know, what applica- what part of the application is actually running and then what part is actually you know, compiled and you can look for dead code opportunities too. So that gives us a, a very deep view of all the, the classes that are out there, the, the enterprise Java beans, the, the memory objects, looking at all the interactions across those classes, the database calls, the calls up to the UI. Really, we're looking at that business logic and beginning to look at how all the components interact and looking for dependencies and interdependencies. Where the AI starts to come in is we're looking at these graph machine learning and you look for communities and clusters of activity, which usually indicates a domain or domain driven design typically is is based around business functions. So we're looking to find a, a set of activities that are related together and finding optimal entry points for those those services. So the AI that we use looks at graph machine learning, builds communities, looks for dependencies, and looks for uh, clusters where we actually say, this is actually a, a likely domain. Here's an optimal entry point. Here's three or four uh, interdependencies that we can't figure out what to do with. But if you just fix these three, there's a, a chance that this will become a microservice you can extract that's got 100% exclusivity. And exclusivity is how we measure independence of a particular microservice. So what we end up doing, we take all that information, we process, synthesize it, present the user with a basically a direct graph that looks at a lot of bubbles, a lot of arrows, and each of these indicate a potential microservice or domain that we've identified, and then the interactions between those. And it also identifies where the um, overlap or interdependencies that need to be resolved that can be now this is where the architect might come in and say, oh, I want to combine these two services. I want to split them up. I want to rename it. So there's an interactive component where the architect can look at it and say, oh, okay. But what we find is that many of these projects have been going on for multiple years. And we're just working with a customer this week, two-year project. 
unable to extract even one service from there. And what we, you know, even by looking at that first analysis, you start seeing the application in a new way. It's much like domain-driven analysis and event storming is a technique people have used over the last 10 to 12 years where they put a bunch of architects in a room and you put a bunch of sticky notes and you try to determine where the classes are and what the what the flow is through the application. And you draw circles around them and on the whiteboard. I mean, it lasts 30, 40 days or something like that. You, know, you get a dojo going um, and then you all go off and try to work that out. Very manual process, very people intensive. What we've done is basically automate a lot of that um, analysis and present it to an architect um, who then can work with his developers to go identify a class or two, be able to pull that out, extract that. At that point, we can actually pull in the source code and create a new project that can be then put in your CI CD and run as a container and move forward. Typically, people do this iteratively. They'll pull out one or two or three services at a time. They may leave some in the monolith. They may kill the monolith later on. So there's a, we call it kind of iterative refactoring or selective refactoring. But it's a process that is very painful today, high risk, and very manly intensive. But the AI really provides that what you would typically have a high-powered architect come in and be able to look at and, and, and go through a... All, all the details of, of the code itself. All we look at is the running code, we do static analysis, put it together, present that to the user. There's a set of refinement that the application allows you to do. What if, what if I change this? What if I, I do this? You can actually go back and you know undo certain ac- actions. You know, how do I unify these things? How do I make them independent or, or more dependent on each other? And you come up with the architecture you wanna have. Typically, it's not a a big bang architecture. Like I said, it's iterative. It takes something that used to take uh, years down to weeks or days sometimes. So just that initial impact of being able to see the application, see the dependencies, understand how things are related in a architectural way is is something you can't get from a profiler or from other kind of code analysis tools or application performance monitoring tool. They kind of give you bits and pieces of it, but they weren't purpose-built to look at all those dependencies and then identify how you extract it, find those service boundaries, find the optimal API entry points where you'll put the REST APIs and then be able to extract that out, take that source code, put it into a new project and begin to move that monolith down to the uh, components and make it up. So, so that's called Modernization Hub for vFunction. That's the full refactoring and AI platform. We also have an assessment hub, which you use upfront to do uh, upfront analysis. And that's where you do more technical debt analysis. You identify the risk and complexity in advance of a modernization project. Maybe identify the top 10 Java classes you would take to what load they put on technical debt, what impact they have, and what ROI you get for taking those out. So it gives you a good basis and data-driven way to start a modernization analysis which then leads into a full-blown refactoring project for those you choose to do. So we kind of look at the, the front end of assessment, give them more data, set up expectations, share that with, you know, across from developers up through the architects, up to the executives who are making the, the go, no go decision, you know, have a clear set of uh, goals and then use that as a way to get a project off the ground more successfully. Cause that's a huge part of um, having a successful modernization project is how you start, and where you set your before, so you can also identify what the after is. You have that before and after view too. Yeah, I would rather measure five times and cut once because – so I'd go through that analysis numerous times before I even step into that modernization section because it, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and I, and I think what's been lacking for a lot of uh, uh, practitioners is you know how to do that. There's no set of best practices of how to set up and, and do that analysis – and, and be able to you know, calculate what, what are the benefits? Where am I going to start? What classes am I going to have to you know, work? How does this application compare to another application or compare to the rest of the industry in terms of the debt it's carrying or the dependencies? We look at the complexity in terms of the degree of entanglement of a lot of the classes. So we can actually identify how tangled they are, you might say, <laughs> um, the density of them. And also we look at risk of change, which is interesting is dependency change can be measured. And those dependency change, say if I change here, what's the impact of other changes downstream? And that, so that identifies risk and complexity, which could be rolled up into an overall technical debt score. And that's a very scientific way to do it. There's academic research that kind of supports it. But we're trying to chip away at some of the, the myths and, and the, the lack of data 
some of the murkiness and kind of provide more data, more science behind it. And the AI helps do that. And kind of it, it is a, a catalyst into a, a takes projects that are kind of stalled and then moves that forward in a way that gets you kind of much further along in the process, accelerates it, gets that velocity back and gives people hope too. Cause it's, I mean, it's a frustrating, it's a frustrating job and uh, you're dealing with, you know, it's like when you open up the, you know, uh, at the holidays, you take out all your Christmas lights and they're all tangled up. And you're like, oh my God, how am I going to, how did I put that in there? What am I going to do with it? And you spend hours, eventually some of the lights buy new lights. <laughs> it's, it's too tangled. So um, I think those are some of the analogies that come to mind in terms of uh, how do you detangle things that are just un- undetangleable? Uh, and we kind of help with that. So is V function a SaaS? Is it on-premise? How does it play out? Yeah, so it's a um, it's a product that can run in the cloud or or on-prem. It's it's a uh, user installed that you can install in your on-prem behind your firewall. Um, you can do it up in your own cloud environment. We have a, a SaaS component that's coming out that for the assessment side of things, so it allows you to quickly look at and download a quick agent that can then analyze technical debt. So that's where the SaaS comes in. So currently the uh, analysis happens in a more secure way. Everything stays in your environment, nothing leaves it. And it's either installed on-prem or in your environment. So um, up in the cloud. Yeah. The, the way that we were saying that, and I, I, I misspoke, mm-hmm. the way that we're saying this from now on forever, amen, mm-hmm. is self-managed. We're not saying on-prem mm-hmm. anymore. We're saying self-managed ah, yes. because we don't care where it is, yes. but you're the one. So you've got analysis coming. Mm-hmm. To be SaaS based. Mm-hmm. So basically all I'd have to do is install an agent yep. on fill in the blank app. Yes. Make sure that make sure I'm getting mm-hmm. an act back. I can see it in the console, much like any other APM tool that exists today. Yep. And, and let it run for yep. X amount of time. Yeah, just let it run for a day or so, or even less. We'll, we'll flag it when it's done. See, um, yeah. And, and this will be coming out you know, by September. So I think by the time this drops, we'll, the assessment as a service will be available. So, um, so I think that's, that's something that, you know, people who are listeners can, can check out B-Function and, and sample it right away. And it's a quick, quick way to get going. And then it leads you directly into a modernization project if you want to. And then we can take it from there. But like the upfront work is the most important. You want to measure, measure, measure. And, and that's such a, a huge need right now. And, and we see that over and over again, that there's just a lack of data for people who are trying to do that themselves. So what happens if while I'm capturing this analysis? Mm-hmm that a big chunk of the code never even gets executed because time of day, time Mm -hmm. of month, time of Mm -hmm. quarter, Mm -hmm. right? Because I may have processes Mm -hmm. because it's a monolith, everything's in the monolith. Mm -hmm. And I didn't happen to be analyzing during the Mm -hmm. end of quarter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's where the static and dynamic analysis kind of comes in where dynamic will tell you what's running. Static will tell you how much is there. And, And we actually will look at coverage and look at, you know, where is there overlap? Is there something that's not covered in the dynamic? And use that as a discussion around: Should you run more case, you know, test cases? Are there, you know, um, different use cases you want to run? Um, do we miss something, or is this a, a a case of dead code? Is this code just never exercised anymore? I mean, that's one of the big problems when you do refactoring or rearchitecting any kind of modernization. A lot of people just carry stuff forward because they're not sure what it did. Like, I know it's here. I'm not sure what it's for, but I'm afraid to take it out. And that, I mean. My my first ten years in software development were kind of like that. Well, I don't want to. I'm not sure what that does. Someone else wrote it, but I'm not going to take it out. So I might just leave it in there. And that that's where debt starts coming in, and, and it starts building up. So we can help you identify potential dead code, um, but also identify where coverage was met, and you want to run either more test cases against it, or uh, let it run longer to get the full pattern. Maybe to let it run a week, a month, uh, to get the full pattern for that. Is it language specific? Java um, was where we started, and the, the whole Java enterprise environment. You think of like Web Logic, Web Sphere, Spring, Spring Boot, running on, like you said, Tomcat servers, et cetera. There's a, a huge, that's probably 60, 70% of the monolith market today for the enterprise. Next chunk is .NET. And so we both support both the, the Java side, .NET side. Maybe more in the future, but that kind of is the two big chunks of uh, where the pain points are. AI and the intelligence is abstracted above the um, 
the application language itself. So it's easy to apply that to different languages. So over time, we could put in some different kind of underpinnings and uh, components and uh, instrumentation that allow us to pull that in. But pulling a Java instrumentation is a little different than pulling a .NET instrumentation and, and so, so forth. So, And it's funny, the Java and .NET communities, there's so much over the last 20 years, different packages, different open source products, different you know ways people have deployed it. It's interesting how they how this has evolved, and you kind of can see how it's once people have committed to it, how, how hard it is to kind of untangle uh, themselves from that and kind of uh, and do that refactoring. So that's kind of one of the big need factors that while we're here is to help them through that. Well, I'm disappointed now. I expected you would say Cobol that I would see. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny COBOL microservices running in Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, we, um, <laughs> that would make my day. Yeah, we um, we had high hopes when we looked at some of the COBOL translators. The, there's COBOL to Java translators, but the code is unmanageable once you do that translation. Typically, I think there's new yeah. technology that might help that COBOL to Java. But right now, it's it's machine generated and unmaintainable, and, and it's really hard to parse. And there's a lot of it's it's not something that a human can maintain going forward. It will work. Um, but so we uh, we've tried it, and uh, we continue to get lots of requests because COBOL mainframe, all that stuff is 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 still a, a massive need. And yeah, I, I'd love to say yes, but not today. So talk talk about hiring for legacy applications, hiring for COBOL. Yeah, I guess if you know it, you can make really good money in the twenty twenty. I think so. I think I think so. And uh, it's it's uh, amazing how much of it is still there. And uh, and how critical it is for companies that, that still have it, but it's it's a big goal for people to figure out how to how to move off of it. So, um, and that that'll be a, with us for a while as we continue to chip away at modernization and taking it forward. Well, all of Bob's contact information will be down in the show notes. If you're at any of the big shows, reinvent the spring show coming up in the fall of 2022. If you're listening to it, then search out V function, uh, especially if you're trying to do app modernization because. Lord knows I went through it for the past 30 plus years and i never saw one actually go right to begin with. So maybe we can get it this time with AI. Bob, thanks for being with us today. Yeah. Thank you all. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcast, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox.